Greetings! This is Dr. Faith Acker, again, and this video will be about introductions. All parts of an essay are important. The body, the examples, the explanations, the introductions, and the conclusion. No one part of an essay can survive without the other parts. However, the introduction bears a special weight within an essay. It is the part of the essay that helps your reader decide whether your reader would like to continue reading the essay. The Little Brown Handbook says on page 40 that the introduction captures and focuses readers' attention. And that is true. The goal of an introduction is to help your readers understand what you're writing about, to get a feel for your style, and to obtain the necessary background information that will help them process the essay that follows. In particular, most introductions often contain either a thesis statement or a hint about the direction the essay itself is likely to go. An introduction should specify the topic of the essay, but also it should specify the specific tack you're going to take. It's not enough to know that you're writing an essay on elephants. I want to know what aspect of elephants or elephant culture you'll be covering. Depending on the type of essay you're writing, the introduction could serve a number of different purposes. In many essays, the introduction provides essential background information. That might be historical, it could be shocking statistics, it could even be definitions. In other types of essay, the introduction will begin with a sense of the disagreement that you're writing to respond to, or a sense of a problem that you're hoping to solve. In these instances, your introduction is much more likely to start with a thesis statement. Sometimes your introduction will paint a picture, giving your readers, particularly in a descriptive essay, a moment in which you walk up to your subject and literally describe what it looks like so that your reader begins with a picture and then continues on to read your argument. Let's look at a few different types of introductions and different types of introduction structures. In the moments that follow, I'll be showing you and talking you through three different styles of introductions. One is written for a governmental paper trying to argue for a particular position. The second is an opinion editorial from a national newspaper again arguing for a particular position. And the third is actually from an academic book, a historical account of a plague in the city of Newcastle. And it's one of the best pieces of expository writing I can share with you as you prepare for a descriptive essay. Let's begin. Here's the first paragraph of an article on drones in US airspace. It's one of two paragraphs used to introduce a recommendation paper. You can read the full text of this paper in your Cross Currents book if you're in my course this semester. It's also available online at the link given at the top. Because this is written as a recommendation for the government, the authors want to appear as unbiased as possible, and so they overview some of the positions they're going to take, but give you a slight hint about the conclusion they're going to draw at the end of their essay. There are four sentences in this paragraph. The first one talks about, quote unquote, the problem. Rapidly advancing technology has made it possible to employ drones for public missions as well as private purposes. It gives some examples. Then it sets out why this is an important paper that it should be writing. As new technologies present these options to policymakers, it is an opportune time to establish general principles and legal guidelines for the government's use of drones in domestic airspace. Finally, it narrows down onto the points it's particularly going to be addressing in this particular paper. It wants to address Congress and also tell you about which elements of drones are vital to this particular paper. It wants to talk about safety and transit issues, but it also wants to define the scope of permissible federal activities. It's urging Congress to play an active role in establishing these guidelines, and the rest of the paper is going to go into greater detail on these safety issues, these transit issues, and particularly on the types of regulation that the writers of the paper recommend that Congress legislate. This next paragraph comes from an article in the Los Angeles Times by a more popular writer named David Lazarus. David Lazarus is trying to use a lot of rhetorical effect in this and also to write an essay that's perhaps slightly shocking. You'll notice that the style of this paragraph is much less formal 
In fact, there's even a sentence fragment, the second clause. I have taken the liberty, originally David Lazarus wrote this in four separate paragraphs, I have merged these four together to make it easier for you to read and also easier for you to conceptualize as you think about this as its own introduction. He starts with a bit of an attention getter, but it's more an attention getter because of his rhetoric than it is an attention getter because it says sh something shocking. He's talking about weight. Now that calorie counts on restaurant menus are a done deal, he says, it's time to take the next step towards slimming America's flabby waistline, a national soda tax. See, he's already given you in the first two sentences, which could easily have been combined into one sentence so that it wasn't grammatically inaccurate, but he's given you in these two sentences his position. He's going to spend the remainder of this article arguing for a national soda tax. What he does with the rest of his introduction is he establishes that he's aware that not everyone is going to share his opinion. I know, I know, he says. This is the kind of nanny state talk that causes seizures among conservatives and libertarians. It's an intrusion on personal freedom, a trampling of consumer choice. Blah, blah, blah. Now, you can tell his tone is much less formal, and you can also see that he's dismissing some of these arguments. You probably don't want to adopt his tone in quite this level of casualness for an academic essay, but it is an example of one way in which a writer constructs a structure that identifies its main point and then acknowledges that not everyone is going to share it. He concludes with a sentence that works again much like a thesis statement. As we've learned from taxes on cigarettes and alcohol, a soda tax would be a highly effective method of influencing behavior that carries high social costs. So at the end of his paragraph, he's returned to his starting point, having acknowledged that he and his audience would have some different opinions. His first sentence still states his opinion, but he uses it as an attention getter, mostly because he's saying some slightly casual or perhaps even antagonistic things. Together, he shows you the argument he's going to pursue, and he acknowledges that he's familiar with more approaches to the subject than just the one that he'll be advocating for in his opinion piece. I want to end this discussion of introductions with one of my real favorites. It's from a historical book called Ralph Taylor's Summer, written by a scholar named Keith Wrightson. Keith Wrightson studies wills and historical documents from the 17th century, which is the time in which Ralph Taylor lived. And as he read through these documents, he became fascinated by the signature of this man, Ralph Taylor, that kept appearing at the bottom of a number of legal and other documents. Ralph Taylor was a scrivener, which means that the documents we have from him were largely written for other people. Wills or inventories or statements of estate, a lot of documents that don't have a great deal of personality. And his signature is unique because it's probably one of the only things on any of these documents that allows Ralph Taylor any creative freedom. In the rest of this book, Keith Wrightson goes on to describe Ralph Taylor's life through the documents that he handled. For instance, Ralph Taylor was alive during a great plague in Newcastle and so Wrightson looks at the wills that Taylor would have written and the inventories that Taylor would have written and describes the ways in which Ralph Taylor moved around this city and even watched a huge number of people die during this early pandemic. We don't have any photographs of Ralph Taylor. It was a long time ago. And we don't even really have very many records that show what his family was like. Instead, we just have these documents that show that he was interacting with certain types of dying and deceased people through the entirety of this plague. So as Keith writes and introduces you to this, he brings you in the way that he also discovered Ralph Taylor by showing you the first time that he discovered Ralph Taylor's signature and even knew that such a man as Ralph Taylor existed. It was his signature, he says, that first drew me to Ralph Taylor, an elaborate and distinctive signature placed at the bottom of a deposition made before the consistory court of the Bishop of Durham in February 1637. And in the rest of this beautiful paragraph, Keith writes and just describes the signature. He shows you every loop and every swirl, and he uses beautiful metaphors, some from the material arts, like the skein of swirling loops that might remind you of yarn. One, of course, that refers to a pen, 
and then another one that makes a water metaphor, an eddy of loops. The effect of the whole, Wrightson says, after he's talked you through this entire paragraph, is a resting in its extravagance. And one of the reasons I've added this to this particular slideshow is because if you're in my class, you'll be starting this class with a descriptive essay. And as you describe a place that's familiar to you and unfamiliar to me, I would love for you to go back to the moment when you first discovered this place and see if you can give me a little bit of the novelty of finding this wonderful place and bringing me into it through a very vivid, perhaps even metaphorical description that shows me what it would be like to encounter this place that you're describing for the very first time. 